it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Uh, and um, we worked quite a while to f identify uh, a good topic for a keynote talk, and uh, and in line with working together and collaborating, uh, we we think we came up with a, a good choice. So uh, we know we came up with a good choice. Uh, <coughs> So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Kelly Schenk. Uh, Kelly has a 20-year history working with the Environmental Protection Agency in DC and, uh, and closely with federal and state agencies and key stakeholders in the Chesapeake Bay program. So some of you from this area know that uh, much more intimately than I would in the Midwest, but uh, even, even in the Midwest we, we hear quite a bit about that. Uh, she's worked with stakeholders both on technical and policy fronts, addressing agriculture, toxics, and urban stormwater issues. Kelly has devoted her last 10 years to building partnerships with federal and state agricultural agencies and with the agricultural community uh, to find collaborative solutions to achieving the agency's uh, shared goals of vibrant agriculture and clean water. Uh, Kelly has served as agricultural advisor for EPA Region 3, which is here in the mid at Atlantic region of the country, uh, including most of the Chesapeake Bay watershed for the past three years. In her role as agricultural advisor, Kelly serves as the liaison between agricultural community and EPA in addressing policy and programmatic opportunities and challenges. Uh, facing the, re the region and, uh, and the communities, the agricultural communities in the region, uh, with the goal of achieving well-managed, profitable farms and clean, local, and Chesapeake Bay waters. Uh, I think I'll jump down and, and I noted that uh, she had a much better opportunity to cut her teeth in this area. Uh, she cut her teeth in environmental um, work in France, working on water quality issues, uh, urban phosphorus pollution in Lake Champlain and Lake Geneva. So uh, we have a Lake Geneva in Wisconsin, but I don't think it's anything uh, quite that close. So uh, let's give uh, Kelly a, a hand and get her set up. Well, thank you for that really nice introduction, Rick. And um, I'm thrilled to be chosen to speak to you today about working collaboratively with the agriculture community. Um, I also want to join my fellow North Carolinians um, in welcoming you to North Carolina. Um, I grew up here. And in fact, um, my mom was Miss Carey in 1961 <laughs> when the town was only 900 and it was called a town. Um, let me see a show of hands on um, who went to the pig picking last night. Okay, it's called a pig picking, Jeff. He kept on calling it a pig out. Um, <laughs> not from North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and you know, there's this big question about vinegar base, which is North Carolina style barbecue, and then that other stuff that's red. Who had vinegar base last night? All right, you are true North Carolinians. Um, okay, so as, as Rick said, I am in what they call an agriculture advisor for EPA, and we have an ag advisor in each of the 10 regions throughout the country, and our job really is to be a link between the ag community and the agency. And my mantra has always been that we can have viable, profitable agriculture and clean water. And our Chesapeake Bay ag secretaries feel the same way. Um, and last year, last summer, they published an article in Lancaster Farming, which is our big ag newspaper on the Mid-Atlantic, and they, they had this quote in here. Some might think that having productive farms and clean water are contradictory pursuits. They are not. Clean water depends on healthy, viable farms, and healthy, viable farms depend on clean water. Achieving both is our goal. And that message is really spreading, you might say, like butter on a roll. Um, I'm glad you guys are laughing at these jokes. <laughs> That's all I've got. Um, but I'm obsessed with the Pennsylvania Farm Show's butter sculpture. Every year they have a different theme. And um, you know, this is probably my favorite theme, Shake, Rattle, and Roll. It was like a 1950s diner serving milkshakes, and you have these life-size cows dancing. 
Um, but if you fast forward to this year, in 2017, the theme was a culture of stewardship. They were paying tribute to dairy farmers for their environmental stewardship and implementing practices like manure storage, um, livestock exclusion from streams, riparian forest buffers. And, you know, it's not as exciting as cows dancing, you know, in a diner, but um, very exciting for us that they chose to highlight farmers as environmental stewards. So what I want to talk to you today about is just lessons that we are learning as we move forward in um, trying to achieve viable, profitable, thriving farming into the future and clean water. And, and you know, what we've learned about the importance of collaborating with the agriculture community and, and making that happen. And before I do that, I wanted to give you just sort of a virtual tour of the Chesapeake Bay since a, a number of the examples I'm going to be using is in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And um, that'll help folks get up to speed who might be attending the four o'clock session this afternoon um, on Chesapeake Bay. I have to put in a plug for my people. Um, so the, the watershed is comprised of six mid-Atlantic states in the District of Columbia. It's the largest estuary in North America. We have tens and thousands of streams and creeks and rivers flowing into the Chesapeake Bay and, and you know, 18 million people living in our watershed and growing. It's quite diverse. We have over 3,600 species of plants and animals and, and fish in, in the Chesapeake Bay, including our beloved rockfish and um, blue crab, of course. No matter where you go in the Chesapeake Bay, whether you're up in the headwaters trout fishing or you're down at the mouth of the bay paddling near the marshlands or in the marina area where my office is, um, we have impaired waters. 90% of our waters are impaired due to nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediment. And we're real fortunate to have the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership. It's a regional partnership that has really led and directed the restoration of the Chesapeake Bay since the, the early 80s. And I'm not going to go over this whole org chart for you, but I just want to make the point that we have a lot of committees, a lot of teams, a lot of work groups that have federal, state, local stakeholders, land grant universities, ag interests, urban interests, home builders, and we're all at the table talking about, you know, how do we define the problem, how do we solve the problem, what are our strategies, and how do we measure our progress. And that's been a tremendous value um, in terms of building the science and building the consensus on how to move forward. Now we started out as a voluntary partnership and we we set out to restore the entire Chesapeake Bay by 2010. We knew that was a tall order. And um, at, when 2010 came by, we still had these impairments. We had made progress, but we weren't there yet. We initiated the um, Chesapeake Bay TMDL, which stands for Total Maximum Daily Load, or we, we call it a pollution diet. It basically spells out the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reductions we need to achieve to have that restored bay. And what we did was we took those reductions that were needed and each state has a certain chunk to reduce over time. And the states developed plans for how they were gonna divvy up their reductions among agriculture, wastewater treatment plants, and urban stormwater and other sources. And they set milestones two year, every two years to say, here's the pollution my state plans to um, reduce within this two year period, here are the practices I plan to implement on, in my state to get there. Here are the programs and policies we're putting in place. The end game is that by 2025, we'll have all of the practices on the ground that will eventually result in a clean and restored bay meeting our water quality standards. And we measure our progress annually um, through modeling tools and then also through water quality monitoring, which is the final determinator in terms of you know, whether we've met our um, you know, water quality standards and the bay is restored. Now, agriculture is a big part of the solution in the Chesapeake Bay re restoration. Um, agriculture and wastewater treatment plants have by far reduced the most loads going into the Chesapeake Bay. And states, when they develop their plans for how to get these, the last remaining load reductions they need, they're relying on agriculture to achieve roughly two-thirds of the necessary nutrient reductions. Why is that? Well, agriculture is our biggest land use, therefore our biggest load entering the Chesapeake Bay. 
And from a relative standpoint, it's more cost effective to reduce nutrients from ag lands than, for example, urban retrofits. And so you'll see a heavy reliance on, on states and, and working with the ag community to um, build on their successes to date and, and achieve further reductions to meet these goals. So just to give you a picture of, of agriculture in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, if you can see the yellow on this map is, is agriculture, the green is forest. We have about 87,000 farms. Um, a quarter of our watershed is, is cropland, 8.5 million acres, mostly corn and soybean. It's such an important part of our heritage, our quality of life, and, and definitely our economy. Now I know we're not the Midwest, and I was on an Iowa farm harvesting soybeans on a combine, and, and that is serious. You're seriously in the heartland, and you're talking 3,000 acres. Our farms are, you know, maybe 300 acres. But we actually do have a big part of, you know, role in the economy. Um, in Pennsylvania, for example, um, we're about top four for egg and milk production in the United States. Um, the Delmarva Peninsula, which is the part of the eastern shore of Maryland and Virginia and Delaware, um, that's our broiler country, so we're in the top 10 in the U.S. for that. And then the Shenandoah Valley in, in Virginia is in the top five for Turkey. So agriculture is a critical piece of our heritage, our culture, and our economy, and we want to keep it that way. This map of the watershed was developed by USGS through their Sparrow analysis, where it shows um, phosphorus pollution coming from agricultural lands into the Chesapeake Bay. And the darker the color, the, the greater the loads. And you'll see that you know, where we have the greatest ag nutrient loads are in these regions where we have the most dense animal operations. So we certainly have some manure challenges that we're addressing in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. If you were to look at the state watershed implementation plans just to see what are they asking agriculture to do? Are there some kind of wild and crazy ideas or you know, what, are they, what are they calling for? It's really what I would consider tried and true common sense practices that you often see on farms, you know, in terms of um, having animal waste systems, excluding cows from the stream, um, having buffers on your streams, nutrient management, no-till, cover crops. Um, you know, the, the goals are reasonable in terms of these are practices you, you would hope to see on farms. However, the, the level of implementation states are calling for, 90% of the farmers implementing these practices, 100% in some case, that's where the lift gets really hard and obviously who pays for that is a big issue. So there's, there's a lot to do. Um, that's kind of the, the backdrop of the Chesapeake Bay and, and Act's role in the restoration. Um, I want to jump into, you know, three lessons um, that I've kind of tried to distill down that we've learned um, in working and collaborating with the agriculture community. And they seem kind of simple, you know, work together to define the problem. Um, I want to get into some specific examples just so you, you know, I can illustrate um, why that's so important and why that can be so hard. So the first example I want to talk about is um, poultry nutrient generation in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association came to us um, you know, about around the same time that we were developing the Chesapeake Bay Pollution Diet, and they asked this question, you know, how many nutrients are generated by Delmarva chickens? You'll see the, the, the picture of the peninsula there, Delaware, Eastern Shore, Maryland, and Virginia. This is our top broiler production area. And you know, as the TMDL was put in place, you know, they wanted to make sure that good data are driving good decisions. And if we're having all these goals and, and all these milestones and these state plans, what are the data that are being used to drive those goals? And so they, they asked us, you know, can we talk about and better understand what, what data you're using to do that? Well, we have um, Chesapeake Bay program has partnership models that we've developed over decades. And basically, um, we've got inputs to the model, so number of birds, the amount of manure, the amount of nutrients in that manure, um, urban areas, et cetera. We have all the practices that states are reporting they're implementing on the ground, whether it's cover crops or wastewater treatment plant upgrades. And all that feeds into the watershed model where we simulate the loads coming from each source that enter the Chesapeake Bay. 
And then we have a bay water quality model where we determine how those loads affect implementation and achievement of water quality standards. And these tools have been very useful for us to develop strategies, assess our progress over time. But you know, it's often been viewed as a black box um, for the agriculture community. What, what, is, what are the data in there? USDA and the land grant universities and state ag departments are real involved in every step of coming up with what these inputs are. But you know, how, you know, people really at the, at the industry level, at the farm level, may not have been involved in all those meetings. And so having an understanding of what the data are that are feeding the model, I think is a really important thing. So we were thrilled that the U.S. Poultry and Egg Association contacted us and wanted to get together and lift up the hood of the model and evaluate the data. So we d ran a, what we call building a better bay model <coughs> workshop um, to have this discussion. And I, I wanted to have a specific slide on how carefully we set it up from the beginning to try to make sure this was successful. Um, you know, it's hard to get growers, integrators, industry folks at the table for a meeting like this when they're farming. You know, they, they're, they're working 24 seven. And so we, we worked with the industry to say, what's the best way to engage the poultry farmers, integrators, industry? And they said, you know, two-day workshop where we can dive deep and just focus on our questions would be the best way to do it. Then we had to come up with a name of the workshop. And the name we came up with is Building a Better Bay Model Workshop. And honestly, I was a little nervous about that because it implied that the model wasn't good. Well, you know, the model's only as good as the data are that feed it, right? And so for us to acknowledge that it can be better, it can be better with better data, was really important for the industry to realize that, yes, we are in this to make sure we have the best information driving our decisions. And then in terms of hosting, along with the industry, we had University of Maryland. Um, my colleague Mark Dubin is here, and he, he, he could go on and on about setting up this workshop because he was the one that hosted it. Um, but it was important to have a land grant university and the industry together and they specifically said, we want EPA to open up every day and close up every day and have us there to say, we want better data. We want to work with you. We're not out to get you. We, do, we want to make sure we've got the best information. So that kind of setup was really important. The workshop was phenomenal. Um, I wish I had a picture of everybody slogging through all the data, um, but at the time we didn't know we were going to succeed, so we didn't want to take any pictures. <laughs> um, but it, it came, we, they came up with a lot of great recommendations about how to characterize on a regional level poultry nutrient generation. We were using Ag Census and ASABE, um, cage bird studies, and a lot of things, but they said, we think we have better data, and this is what we're willing to bring to the table. And so when we reported out to our Chesapeake Bay Program Agriculture Work Group, they said, let's form a poultry litter subcommittee and have them take these recommendations over the finish line. So this subcommittee, which was comprised of the land grant universities, the state ag departments, USDA, um, people like me, we, they, we pulled all the data together, made all the decisions, came up with recommendations that were finally approved after a two year period. Um, and now this new data is replacing the older data in the model and being used from here on out. It was a two-year process and we hit a lot of bumps in the road. We had plan A and then we had plan B and then we had plan C and then we stopped counting. Every step of the way we probably could have said, well, we tried, sorry it didn't work out. Um, but we had all stuck with it. I think that was important to demonstrate that we, we were committed to try to get the best information into our modeling tools. So what we learned in this situation was that we thought we were engaging the ag community. We had USDA and the state ag departments at, and the universities at these monthly meetings for years and years to build this model and the inputs. That doesn't necessarily mean you've engaged everybody. And the assumption we made that the industry was working directly through the departments of ag to make sure we had the best data, no, not necessarily. So, you know, being able to figure out how to engage growers, integrators, the industry in a way that works for them and having monthly meetings at the Chesapeake Bay Program Office is not it. 
Um, so we, we found that if we could have regular workshop type things where we can dive into the one issue they care about and, and consult with them during key parts of this process, that's probably the better way to go. Um, EPA, we need to prove that we wanted the best data. Um, the poultry industry proved that they were not only willing to critique the model, but actually willing to roll up their sleeves, provide data, and be part of the solution to the model. And the land-grant universities had to prove that they could figure out ways to share data publicly um, and still protect farmer privacy, which is obviously a big issue. And you know, we were really pleased that we have the, what we think is the first regional poultry nutrient database out there. Um, it's definitely increased the ag community's confidence in the model because they know the data, they trust the data, and it's, it's strengthened the trust that we had with each other and able to you know, deal with some tougher issues, which I'll get into. I hope this example gives you some ideas and maybe in your world of how you could apply similar approaches to um, working together to define a problem. Um, the, second, the second example I wanted to talk about continues on with this poultry example on the Del Marva, um, and it's addressing this question. Do we have a nutrient surplus on the Del Marva Peninsula where all the <coughs> broilers are? Now we know what the nutrients are generated, but do we have a problem or a surplus at a county level within the Del Marva Peninsula? And I would say we have completely different answers to that depending on who you ask. And, and you can pick up the paper on any given week and see all of this, all of these different answers in the paper. Um, you know, on the one hand, you'll hear people say we have a 228 million ton surplus of poultry litter on the Maryland Eastern Shore. And then on the other hand, you'll have farmers say we can't find enough litter to accommodate our lands. It's just not there. You know, is it a surplus problem? Is it a distribution problem? You know, we, we had a lot of conflicting viewpoints and, and honestly a, a, a big history of tension and conflict on, on, on what the problem was. It makes it really difficult to solve a problem if you don't have consensus on what it is. And so the, the integrators, the poultry integrators, the state ag departments, the, the you know, key lead growers, decided to develop a group called the Del Marva Land and Litter Challenge. Now, this group met for a year before they invited me to join. And, and I honestly wasn't offended because I feel like you need to have a group come from the ground up um, and, and was very pleased when they pulled in EPA as well and environmental groups and NGOs. And they said, we want to define the problems on the Del Marva and work on solutions. Probably the most important group and I'm not just saying this because I chair it with two other people, but is, is this mass balance subcommittee. Um, we are charged with developing a nutrient budget on a county scale for the Del Mar, where we define for each county, do we have a surplus of poultry litter or a deficit? And it's been, um, it's been an interesting um, experience so far. We're two, two years into it. Um, we have three co-chairs, and I'll explain why. And, and we have members from the integrators, um, growers, state ag agencies, universities, and NGOs. Um, what we are learning, because we're still in this process, is that we absolutely need consensus on the problem if we're gonna solve it. We want to come out as a united front. The environmental groups, the NGOs, the universities, the ag industry all agreeing on what the problem is. And, and we've recognized that resolving this conflict and these different opinions is not going to happen overnight. Um, leadership is important. We, we have evolved as a work group. We finally got to the point just recently where we said we can't just have one person chairing this, representing one, one of the stakeholder groups. We need to have the ag, the, you know, an ag person, an EPA person, and an environmental group person chairing it so that when we develop all of our agendas, we're all working together, when we're assessing what decisions we made at a meeting, we're all on the same page. Because together, we plan on, once we do come up with a mass balance, that we will go out together and preach it to the masses and say, this is what we have consensus on so that we can build support from our respective communities so we don't have this infighting. 
And, and having that validation, those validators that will go out and say, yeah, this is good, we believe in this, let's, let's move on to solving the issue now, now that we've defined the problem is so critical. And, and we know a key piece of this is to have the scientific backing. Um, I'm hoping that some of you are, are in this world doing these kinds of mass balances. You know it, you make a lot of assumptions, so we will have external technical reviewers looking at this to help us to um, see where possible vulnerabilities are. And so if there's anybody that would love to review our report when it's done, um, please come see me. I've already gotten some great ideas just being on the bus with folks yesterday. Um, but we'd love to get your, you know, your input um, from other areas of the country besides the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so um, is everybody doing okay? I know this is kind of <laughs> long. I, I usually give a 20 minute talk. Um, the second lesson, and there's only three, okay. Um, once we define the problem, we need to work together to solve the problem. And it sounds like common sense, but it doesn't always happen this way. And I, I wanted just to talk about the state watershed implementation plans. And I'm just gonna use Virginia as an example this morning. Um, when the states were developing these plans for how they're going to achieve these nutrient reductions to restore the bay, they took really different approaches. And I think Virginia did a really good thing by getting a stakeholder advisory group together where they had one of each stakeholder representing local governments, home builders, environmental organizations, ag interests, all in the same room to say, okay, here's the problem, here's the reductions we need to get, we need to talk about who, what role each of us has in achieving these reductions. Those are difficult discussions to have, but critical. And they formed these local engagement teams where they got 95% of the localities at the table to share data and, and their ideas about strategies. And, and Virginia was really fortunate to have, each year they calculate how much money it's gonna take to meet their Chesapeake Bay goals. And, and that really helped bring the reality check into how, you know, their strategies and what they were developing. Um, what we learned from Virginia is that if you're at the table, if agriculture's at the table, they'll, they'll better understand what the goals are, they'll own the goals, they'll define what their role should be in, in, in achieving these goals. And, and they definitely helped to come up with strategies that were realistic and feasible and worked for them. Um, in Virginia, they have a saying, the Virginia way. And for agriculture, that means no more regulations. You stick with the regulations you have. Anything above and beyond, they wanted to do in a voluntary incentive-based way. They really felt like they could achieve it through these voluntary efforts, not additional regulations. And, and they, they, in their watershed implementation plan, they have a contingency that if Virginia cannot show that they can achieve these ag reductions the Virginia way, that they'll consider mandating these practices. So they, they put kind of a, a, a contingency just in case, but we're very clear that the way it's gonna work for agriculture is these voluntary incentive-based types of approaches. Um, having all the stakeholders in the same room helps to prevent source sectors from blaming each other. You know, they're all figuring out their fair share of the, of the problem. And then lastly, and I don't think we've done this very well yet, but we're planning on it. A lot of these state plans have statewide goals. Like I want to get 400,000 acres of cover crops in Maryland this year. But how that translates to an individual conservation district or a farmer is really complicated. So many times we have farmers say, just tell me what to do and I'll do it and then leave me alone. But translating a statewide plan into something that's meaningful to the folks that are actually having to get these reductions is, is difficult. And so, you know, Virginia really approached it as trying to have some local goals. Um, we have a new um, process in place right now to, for states to refine their plans this year and next year. And as they do that, they're gonna consider having local area planning goals where they might have, you know, for a conservation district, here's the type of reduction or the types of practices we'd like to see at a, a finer scale than just state. And the states need to decide what a local goal would look like, but I think that'll help you know, folks who are in the field trying to figure out what they're supposed to do, own this and, and know what they're supposed to do. Um, the, the second lesson about working together to solve the problem is that we need to be open to a variety of solutions. 
Um, I think that's scary for people from EPA in particular, you know, to try try different approaches. Um, sometimes we just need old faithful. Sometimes it's not going to be this fun, glitzy technology or, or you know, new crazy ideas. It's going to be getting manure to where the ag lands that need it. It sounds boring, but that could really be the solution once we define this um, budget on the Delmarva. Um, and that really gets to the question of are, are people, stakeholders, environmental groups, EPA, willing to have manure application on ag land be a viable solution? I say yes, um, but I'll, I'll tell you there's definite different opinions in different communities about that. And I, I want to take a slight tangent just to illustrate that point. Um, EPA Office of Water has developed a group called the Animal Agriculture Discussion Group, and it's, it's a wonderful venue to have informal conversations between EPA and the National Animal Ag Groups and farmers across the country and USDA and land-grant universities. And our, our goal is to figure out ways to collaborate with each other to achieve our shared interest in, in water quality above and beyond the, the baseline regulations. It's a, it's a three-year-old group and, and we've made some tremendous progress and um, we have a number of people here at the conference that are part of that group that you could talk to to get their take on it. Um, but the first thing the National Animal Agriculture Groups told us was we think EPA views manure only as a waste to regulate and not as a beneficial use. We want to write a brochure with you that says that we all believe that there are beneficial uses of manure. Now, brochure doesn't sound that glitzy, um, but we really felt like we had a lot to prove to, to demonstrate that, yes, we do think manure, if managed well, can have many tremendous beneficial uses. So if you go on our website, you'll see this brochure, you'll see EPA's name alongside all these national ag groups, and we, we you know, make the case for how manure can be turned into valuable products. That was an important step in building a common understanding and proving that you, you, you're, what you're saying is, is actually what your agency means, and, and so having an EPA publication was important. Now beyond um, looking for solutions that are kind of old faithful, as I call them, you know, tried and true, on the flip side, we, we absolutely have to be open to more innovative approaches. Um, farmers are the most innovative people I know, and in Virginia, because they wanted to do it the Virginia way, um, they came up with an Act Certainty program, and I know a number of your states have these as well, and basically what they did was they um, through our modeling tools, we're able to define what list of practices would be deemed, that a farmer could implement, would be deemed in compliance with the Chesapeake Bay pollution diet goals that Virginia had. And they came up with these four practices, nutrient management plan, implementation, conservation plans, buffers, livestock stream exclusion. If a farmer implements those practices, then they would be given um, be deemed in compliance with the Chesapeake Bay TMDL and be given nine years of safe harbor from any additional state nutrient or sediment regulations. This was really important to farmers because they knew in their plan they had a, a contingency that if they couldn't reach their goals, these practices might be mandated. And so for those farmers that wanted to voluntarily implement these practices and get safe harbor, great. And, and, and so from EPA standpoint, we had to be willing and open to say, wow, that could really work. And, and we, we not only said, wow, that could really work, we actually are funding the implementation of that program in Virginia through some of the grants that we give the Commonwealth. So the lessons we're learning just on dealing with agriculture issues, period, is that you've got to be open to a variety of solutions. Um, it's going to take a combination of regulatory programs and voluntary programs, a combination of the tried and true practices and more of the innovation solution, innovative solutions and, and, and who better to come up with those innovative solutions than farmers themselves. Now we can't really do lesson one and lesson two, you know, work together just to define the problem, work together to solve the problem. Um, unless we have a, a, a really good foundation of trust and understanding of each other. And 
I'm not trying to get mushy at all. This is just reality. Um, we need to know each other well and, and find our common ground. And as an ag advisor, and I, I think I could speak for the other nine that are across the country, um, we have found that there's no better way than talking to farmers directly and getting on a farm. I think we all experienced that yesterday, right? Um, in my region, we probably had about 15 what we call ad roundtables over the last couple of years where my regional administrator, the head of the whole Mid-Atlantic um, part of EPA, and I, we, we go out and we work with the state ag secretary in the conservation district and we meet with 10 to 12 farmers and have just a two-way candid conversation, no press, we don't blog about it afterwards. We just ask them what's on their minds, talk about the successes and the challenges of having profitable farming and clean water. What's working, what's not working? What do you hate about EPA programs and policies? What could we be doing better? And, and they, that's been a tremendous um, opportunity um, to talk to one another. And then that usually leads into the farmers inviting us to come to their farms and see firsthand the successes and the challenges. And, and you know, when you go to a farm, you're not going to an office, right? I mean, you, you are at someone's home, you're meeting their family, you're understanding the history of their farm, um, what they're most proud of. You get to see why some of our policies just don't work on an individual farm. And, and I think it just really paints the picture of how different farms are from one another, um, how you need that flexibility and adaptability and, and approaches for getting these reductions. And so it's just been invaluable building that kind of relationship and I, I don't think you can define a problem or solve a problem using the Noah's Ark approach of putting two of every stakeholder in a room and locking the door un unless you've got that you know relationship there and, and, and that takes time to grow. Um, in addition to the ag round tables and farm tours there's also just straight up education that we need and the animal agriculture discussion group after we kind of got the brochure under our belts, they said, you know, we really feel like we need to have an ag water quality education program. Um, with only 2% of the U.S. population working in the ag industry, where do we get our information about agriculture? And the, the industry groups were most concerned that, you know, a lot of the EPA and state agency staff didn't grow up on farms. And so having a baseline understanding of agriculture for all the staff that are working on agriculture in our government agencies is really critical. And then on the flip side, having the ag community understand the links between farming and water quality was really critical. And so thanks to Jill Heemstra's you know, great work, we worked with the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Center to come up with um, an ag education program. We have some great videos web content. Um, we're hoping that this will be launched really soon. It's all done, signed, sealed, and delivered. We just need to get it out the door. Um, but we're really excited about that being a, a, a really valuable tool and um, building that common understanding. And, and we have already have plans for how we're adding videos and modules um, in the near future as well to keep on you know, educating um, on you know, some of the more complex issues. It's that kind of relationship building that I think really enabled us to, um, as an agency, Office of Water, EPA, um, to develop this nutrient recycling challenge. This is my second plug. Thursday at 9 o'clock, there's going to be a great three-hour session about this competition we developed to, to create affordable technologies that recycle nutrients from livestock waste. Um, we were able to develop this program because we we were able to go to the producers that we built relationships with and ask, what do you need to deal with these difficult manure nutrient challenges you're facing? What would be useful? And then we were able to build this program from the ground up with key agriculture partners that you, you see here. And then having the ag industry groups and these partners vouch for this program has allowed us to get some really interesting concepts on the table for discussion. So in, in summary, you know, my, my main point is that um, bring agriculture to the table from the start. I don't know why you know, there's this fear of doing that from day one, um, because if you don't do it at day one, you're going to be doing it at day 1,001, because it's, it's going to come back, and we, we need to figure out how to work together. Um, with budgets getting tighter and tighter, 
um, finding those win-win solutions where we can have what farmers are doing on the ground um, be great for business and great for water quality is where we want to head. And, um, and you know, finding that common ground is going to be critical as we move forward. So those are some of the points I wanted to make. Um, I'd love to answer questions. Um, I'd love to hear from you some of the lessons that you're learning because we certainly um, haven't figured it all out and, and just have a you know, two-way discussion now. I think we've got some time, don't we, Rick? Yeah. OK. This is also working. So. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kelly. Let's give her a, a hand here today. Thanks. I have a couple of questions I could ask, but I'm going to open up to anyone who would like to ask. Um, so uh, one of the things that you talked about was that um, certified environmentally friendly um, program, resource uh, management plan program. And um, I'm curious, I assume that was focused on all producers, not just those who are operating under a permit. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in hearing how you got producers who were not um, in a, in a position of being regulated under a permit to participate in those kinds of um, activities and programs because that always seems to be a challenge to get those folks to the table. Right, that's a good question. Yeah, in the Virginia Ag Certainty Program, you know, their state regulations um, don't cover all operations and the federal regulations don't. So there is a, a chunk, about 50% of their Ag community that isn't regulated under federal and state programs. And so when the state said, you know, as we move forward with the Bay Restoration and we're not making the reductions that we had planned every two years, we might mandate these practices. So there was the fear of additional mandates down the road that drove these farmers who aren't, they're kind of flying under the radar right now of any kind of, you know, federal or state regulatory program. But they, they said, you know, I see the writing on the wall. I don't want to be told what to do. I want to do this my own way. I know these practices I need to put in place. I'm going to do it now and, and, and lock it in for the next nine years so that I have some predictability in my business. Now, that's not the only driver, the heavy hammer, fear of new regulations. I think a lot of farmers are you know, seeing other drivers. I mean, we, we have consumer demands. Consumers are setting some standards now. We have um, corporate sustainability programs that are setting some standards for, for growers. Um, we have the food supply chain, the Walmarts of the world um, saying they want food grown a certain way environmentally. And, and so we're seeing, you know, that the, our farmers are, you know, looking at all these moving parts and, and potential requirements, if you will, or, or, you know, standards and figuring out how can we best meet them. Um, and so I think there's a lot of drivers that could be used to set up a program like that. But in Virginia, it was, it was mainly, you know, the fear of being further regulated. And, and the Farm Bureau was the one who said, we want a program like this, that they actually came to the state government and said, we, we want this kind of program. We see it working in other areas. So it really did come from the ag, ag industry groups. Hi, Kelly. You, you mentioned that agriculture had, I think, 25% of the land mm -hmm. in the Del Mar, or Chesapeake Bay watershed, but provided 60% of the reductions so far Is that yeah that what, what I was and, and I know the pie charts get a little confusing um, they agriculture makes up is a, says the, the, the second largest land use just second to forest um, they they make up about a quarter of the land use um, in terms of nutrient loads coming to the Chesapeake Bay it's about you know 40 to 60 percent of the loads coming in to the Chesapeake Bay are coming from agriculture. And, and so the states, when they developed how to divvy up their load reductions, you see them putting a big chunk of the focus on agriculture. Even though agriculture is reduced a lot already, it's just a function, a sheer function of land use. There's so many acres and, and, and loads. And, and, and so that actually gets to my question. 
How has the land use changed in, in, the, in the Bay Area, in the watershed? And are, I'm guessing that that is uh, changing to urban and suburban. And how is that changing, um, or how should it change any approaches to uh, nutrient yeah. sediment reduction? Yes, um, we have a fast growing urbanizing area. Um, when you look at the different sources, um, wastewater treatment plants, most of the wastewater treatment plants have gone to the limit of technology in, in most states, and they've met their goals 10 years ahead of schedule. Um, you see agricultural loads going down. For urban, urban loads are going up. We're not even going in the right direction yet. Um, if you controlled all the urban loads, however, even the growing loads, it would not restore the bay just because of the sheer magnitude of ag land use. So we, we are seeing ag playing a really significant role in the, the you know, solution to the bay restoration, but if we don't get a handle on urban growth, we're gonna lose ground. And so you see the states really focusing on um, strengthening their stormwater permitting programs, um, better controlling um, these nutrients and sediment from urban areas um, through the phase two MS4 permits, for example. And so that is a big piece. And even if urban's not gonna solve the problem on its own, everybody needs to do the fair share. And so you're seeing the states really um, be you know pretty stringent on how they're approaching their permitting programs and making sure they're getting the reductions that they should be getting out of those programs. Um, uh, Bill Rector, yes. So the Del Marva Peninsula seems like a pretty special problem. Uh, you mentioned the nutrient management and ag waste and buffers and cover crops right. as the, the normal suite to solve problem, but if, if you look at the Del Marva and do the map, you have more nutrients from manure than you have cropland spread. So what kind of, how do we want to approach that right. uh, problem in the Del Marva? You know, we're trying to feed the world, right, and also have healthy, clean waters regionally. And, and you're hitting on the, the very question that we're trying to ask, which is, I think there's general agreement that the lower part of the Eastern Shore is where we have a lot of the excess you know, poultry litter. And we, we hear people say all the time that up in the northern part of the peninsula, we could be putting and distributing that litter there on the cropland. Now, that's all part of this mass balance work we're doing. We need to know what the truth is, looking at the data, cranking through the numbers to know. Um, manure transport and redistribution is a piece of it, but we also have a subcommittee that's specifically focused on advancing alternative uses beyond ag land application. And that's really where the technology piece comes in. And you guys are the technology experts. That's why I did not talk about it because I don't want you to ask me something too technical. <laughs> um, but we we have um, Maryland Department of the Agriculture. They have a, a technology fund where they are trying out you know new new technologies with poultry litter on the eastern shore. Um, everything from manure to energy to you know anaerobic digesters. Um, EPA has funded a lot of work through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to test out um, thermal thermal technologies. And so that is definitely in our future. Purdue has some really good things that are focusing on. Um, and, and, and so we know in order to feed the world and have the flexibility to stay sustainable over the long haul, we've got to deal with the distribution issue, but also look further to advancing new technologies and approaches that will make us um, sustainable. So it's, 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 it's a two-pronged you know, approach at this point. And good morning, Kelly. This is Jeff Porter here. Where are you? I can't see. I'm over here. Okay, yeah. I'm the one who came down on that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to call you out on that. Now you're going to ask me a tough question, right? <laughs> uh, you, you listed there for Virginia that they have the, the, the four items, the four practices that they've kind of focused in on. Yes. That they are you know, kind of, I guess, safe for nine years, or mm -hmm. it's called safe harbor. You, you talk about the, the, the cooperation, collaboration, a lot within states. What about between states, and has there been any type of discussions of, of some similar type of applications in some of these other states within the, 
the watershed of saying, okay, if you do these four practices or maybe another four, then, then you're going to be a safe harbor as well. Yes, and, and in fact, we um, all the state Bay Ag secretaries are getting together next week to talk about how to collaborate and cooperate between states in meeting these goals. And it, it's something that the Maryland State Act Secretary put together three years ago to have these annual Earth Day discussions where they share ideas and, and make sure that you know each state is doing you know pulling their weight because the upstream states. If they don't pull their way, all the downstream investments are going to be for naught. And so um, this year is the first year where they invited me and my regional administrator to attend as well. And and you know every state will tell you, oh, we're not you know we're not the same. We we, we do things differently. Of course they do things differently. The farming's different. The state regulatory programs are different. But there are so many opportunities to share approaches. And I'm. I'm thinking particularly in how to deal with the smaller dairies that typically aren't required to have a nutrient management plan. Um, how do you engage them in voluntary efforts to implement nutrient management plans? And, and some of the states, New York and Virginia, have some really creative approaches. Um, and so if we can share information about what's working, what could be applicable to one state or another, it, 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 we're all better off. And so we're seeing a lot more of that information sharing now. Um, folks are looking outside to Minnesota's Act Certainty Program because that's been around for a lot longer and is showing a lot of really great results. And states are trying to figure out what lessons can they learn from those other regions and how can they apply it. So um, that kind of communication is critical and I, I think the, the Bay Program Partnership, the fact that we have an agricultural work group with every state represented, allows for that kind of back and forth and sharing. Hey Kelly, this is Amy right here next to Jeff. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, kind of as a follow up to my earlier question, um, I assume most states have the same issue that we see in Nebraska. Um, um, you have the producers who own the animals and own the manure, and maybe whether or not they're regulated um, under a permit, they, they're in charge of how that manure is land applied. Mm -hmm. But what about the folks who, when the manure is transferred, and the person taking it doesn't own the animals, or, and, and so they're not under a nutrient management plan. Um, how did you engage those kind of folks in their manure management? And also, for the people who maybe are supplementing or completely fertilizing with commercial fertilizer, yeah. was that, did you have that group involved, and, and how did you involve them? Yeah, the, you, you point at a, the difference in state programs. Um, some states like Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware require that if your manure is transported off the farm, whoever is receiving it has to apply it based on a nutrient management plan. So that's easy, right? And then there are other states that you lose control of it once it leaves the site. And, and so that's a problem. We don't, you know, these ag certainty programs, you, you can pull in, if there's somebody that's receiving manure and applying it, they can choose to voluntarily be part of this program, but they would have to be applying based on nutrient management plan. Somebody have to come to their site and verify it, and, and, and they could get sucked into the program that way. But, um, but, but it's a big challenge. Um, you know, moving it off one area and putting it on another where you might still have a problem is, 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 a, is a big issue. And so states have really different approaches for handling that. And so from EPA's standpoint, we evaluated every state agriculture, animal agriculture program, regulatory and voluntary, to see how aligned are they with meeting these Chesapeake Bay goals and where are the potential shortcomings. And so, you know, these 50, 100 page reports for each state kind of highlight where that issue is and, and, and how do you deal with it. It could be dealt with through an act certainty program, it could be dealt with closing some loopholes in state regulations and that's really up to the state to decide. But, but that's a really good point you raise that we're, we're grappling with now. Back here, uh, another question kind of in that same vein. Um, I know a lot of uh, the states in that area have either mandatory or voluntary manure applicator uh, programs. So in other words, what we found is that it's the land application of manure that typically has the biggest issues when yes. not done correctly. And so did this program have a discussion or kind of an overarching 
commonality in requiring or putting parameters around the newer application such that folks who do that have to follow a certain guide set of guidelines and or have to be certified to do so and have continuing education that goes along with that, et cetera. Yeah, that, that is a very good point. I mean, if you can be educating all the manure applicators and everybody's singing from the same song sheet in terms of how to comply with nutrient management requirements and apply the manure in a way that's environmentally sound, um, that's where you want to go. And, um, and I would say that, you know, every state is different on that front. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity to educate and, and access that group to make sure that you don't just say you have a plan, you're actually implementing it with the intent. And, and so we see states working really closely with their, their nutrient applicators because it used to be that you could get credit for a nutrient management plan in model world just by saying you had one. Now the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership is saying, listen, we've got to make sure they're implemented and implemented correctly. And so states are being charged with being able to verify that that nutrient management plan is implemented correctly. And so one way that Maryland's doing it, other states are too, is, is doing these trainings and being able to collect data to say, yes, these applicators are applying according to the plan. This plan is implemented correctly. So it's, a, it's an important piece. And, and like I'm, I'm trying to imply that um, not all states have that figured out yet. Um, some states don't even have um, a tracking system yet for their nutrient management plans and, and certainly haven't gone that extra step of being able to say we spot check 10% and, and verify that these are implemented. So that's, that's a path that all the states are on. But in, in our Chesapeake Bay restoration world, um, by next year, if they want credit for these acres that they're reporting under nutrient management, they, they have to have those checks in place. So it's, it's driving in that direction that you're talking about. Uh, yes, I'm just wondering uh, how much consideration is also given to like wetland restoration, oyster bed restoration, so that's uh, part of the solution to nutrient management. Yes, um, I wish I had this little pie chart that it, it shows all the practices that states are relying on most to get their bay restoration goals achieved and the the wetland restoration one is, is a big one. Um, it's a critical piece and, and it does result in a lot of nutrient reductions. Um, so you see a number of states having that as a key component of their plan. Um, we didn't get into in this presentation into the the living resource, the oyster issue very much, but um, as many of you probably know, our oyster population has, has declined over the years and there are a lot of oyster habitat restoration projects as well that are underway. So, so those are two key pieces of state approaches that are, that are happening. Kelly Park Rice, um, the, I like voluntary approaches, but are there also any work being done with some targeted targeted uh, implementation, if we know landscape position is important, and so targeting those areas where you have the most bang for the buck with BMP implementation. Absolutely, um, absolutely. The, the USGS map that I showed where you could see where the greatest nutrient loads are coming to the tidal Chesapeake Bay is one source of information that we use along of with where we have um, ag impairment data from the state's 303D program. Um, we, we absolutely know that it matters where you are in the watershed um, and the way that the nutrients you know, travel down to the Chesapeake Bay matter. Um, a lot of people are surprised when they look at that map that Western Maryland lights up. It's way far away from the main stem of the bay but nitrogen travels pretty quickly just due to the you know, hydrogeomorphology of the area. And so we have um, maps that show here are the priority watersheds with the greatest pollution load coming into the tidal bay. We also have lists of here are the top practices that have the greatest um, nutrient reduction potential. Um, and then we build all that information into um, the NRCS um, Farm Bill programs the state ag cost share programs, EPA's grants to the states, 
Um, all of those funding opportunities have similar priority watershed and priority practice maps. They don't always agree. Um, you know, there's definitely a, a, a healthy debate about where you should focus your efforts and you also have to figure out capacity. Do you have the staff in the field that can assist the farmers and how do you build that if you're gonna focus in on an area? But we, we, we have to do things smarter with less money. And so putting that money where it's gonna make the biggest difference um, in, in terms of load reductions and to the biggest practices that achieve those load reductions is critical. And I'd be happy to share more of that information with anybody that's interested. Hi, I'm Crystal from uh, Nebraska. Just wondering, where are you at in your timeline and goals as far as achieving for the Bay itself? Um, where you're yes. at on your goals and where you hope to get kind of in a timeline? Then? Okay, we are, we, we are basically at what we call the midpoint. Um, I mean, we've been at this since the 80s, um, but the Chesapeake Bay TMDL started in 2010, and our end game is that by 2025, we want to have all the practices on the ground that will eventually reduce the loads enough to meet our water quality standards. And I say it that way because we know there's going to be some lag time. So in 2025, we want to be able to say through our models that all these practices are on the ground, it's resulting in this amount of pollution reduction, and we know water quality standards will eventually be achieved. Um, so we're, we're basically halfway between 2010 and 2025. Um, what's encouraging to me is that we're already seeing the bay coming back. Um, we didn't think we were gonna see these early successes already, and it's, it's encouraging because a lot of work has been put into the bay restoration. So for example, almost 40% of our waters are meeting water quality standards now. Um, last year, submerged aquatic vegetation is really important to us, especially for crab habitat. And we had the, we have about 91,000 acres of submerged aqua aquatic vegetation. That's over half of the goal that we're trying to get to by 2025. Our female crab populations doubled in size last year. That's a good sign. Um, so we're, we're seeing these really encouraging steps to improvements in the Bay already in our living resources. And um, it, it gives us more um, oomph and strength and hope that we just gotta stay the course and, and keep on you know, moving forward. But, but that gives you a sense of the timeline. Oh, there's one. Kelly, uh, enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, one little topic you mentioned among your lessons was the uh, approach of beneficial uses of manure. And uh, it, it seems like, you know, with the regulatory process we've been through in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. we have demonized manure and encouraged our, our local crop producers to purchase commercial fertilizers from outside the region rather than, than yeah. recycling existing resources we have within a region. What's EPA or what's your perspective of that issue and how do maybe we reverse that? Yes, we, I feel like we have a lot more of the scientific defensibility behind us now with all the great work that the Extension of Land Grant Universities and researchers have done to prove that manure is an incredibly valuable resource. And, and so that, scientific underpinning I think has really helped EPA come out with that brochure and I know it sounds silly that I'm highlighting this brochure in a keynote speech but um, but being able to have our agency all the way up to the highest levels because whenever we, we publish something we have to get approval be able to say that we don't view it as a waste to regulate that if it's managed properly we're going to see um, you know some huge benefits to using it and and beyond that, we, we tried to take this a next step where we looked at state approaches for managing manure, and some of them you know, deal with this manure transport and just get it to the lands that need it. And we developed a compendium that's on our website to say, here's some great examples of how states are successfully addressing manure and turning it into a resource. And so highlighting real live examples of how manure can be beneficial um, I think is really important too and something our agency is doing. 
Um, so we've got to get beyond that demonization. And I know at a state level, um, Maryland has a whole campaign called Manure Happens. And um, it's all about telling citizens who live near poultry houses and other people, you know, why it's important. It happens, it's gonna smell bad for these two weeks of the year. Um, this is why farmers are using it. It's an education process. And so we're see, you know, EPA wants to continue that education process and we're seeing states do the same thing. All right, I'm gonna make a comment. Um, we have about, well, we have enough time for three more questions and I'm gonna to have to cut it off after that. And Kelly's been up there for quite a while, we'll give her a break too. But um, <laughs> uh, we'll do two things. One, I haven't heard, but I'll ask uh, her if she's willing to put her presentation, um, make it available. And the other one is if uh, you're not one of the three people who's already raised your hand and uh, let me know your questions. Please, if you like, write it down and we will funnel it to her and, and, uh, and see if we can get a response that way. So. And, and, and I'm here um, through Thursday, so I, I'd be happy to talk to you during breaks anytime. Kelly, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, nutrient uh, trading programs. I know a few states in the Chesapeake Bay area are, are exploring that, and I um, wonder if you could talk a little bit about the successes and challenges currently and uh, where, you think, right. where you think that type of program might go in the future. We, we would love to see trading be a part of the solution here if we can um, achieve the end goal of water quality improvements. Um, Virginia really is the only state that I would say has successfully done point to non-point source trading. Um, Pennsylvania would love to do it. Um, it, the, the, the problem that we're facing um, with Pennsylvania in particular is that they have such a heavy lift in the agriculture sector to reach their Chesapeake Bay goals. And it, you know the, what we're defining as the baseline for trading is that first the ag sector would meet their Chesapeake Bay goals and then they could go above and beyond that and implement more practices to generate credits to sell. Well, when you look at how aggressive their goals are, you have to ask yourself, is there going to be any more that they can do beyond, above and beyond their Chesapeake Bay responsibilities to generate credits? And so that's the discussion we're in now. What's the baseline for trading in the context of the Chesapeake Bay TMDL? It's tricky. Um, Maryland has been really doing a lot with coming up with um, technical tools. They've been using the nutrient trading tool um, or tracking tool um, to estimate what a farmer is doing right now performance wise and um, after when they reach a certain nutrient loading rate off their farm being able to um, quantify what credits they could generate after that and so they've got the technical information in place so they might be in a good position to move forward pretty soon. Um, but, but any kind of creative way of sharing the, the burden and, and figuring out how to work across sectors, I think is, is incredibly important. It's just how do you make sure the end game is met, which is accelerating nutrient reductions. Okay. Uh, on, here we go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the last two questions, uh, I guess were addressed by the, the first question in the queue. So we are done with questions. I want to give a, a real shout out to Kelly uh, for two things. Um, first off, uh, she really responded well to our uh, some of the goals we wanted for the presentation. Uh, I can tell she hit on that because we had plentiful uh, questions. And uh, the other thing is, is uh, a lot of times keynotes come in and uh, just show up there for their talk, and then they they leave. But uh, Kelly was here very beginning of the, the workshop yesterday and went on the tours and has had many uh, discussions. So um, very thankful and appreciative sure. of you being here. And uh, if you have already received a question or two on paper, <laughs> so uh, if you have questions, find one of us. Uh, let's give her a, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.